Welcome to Code in Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. The more and more I work with different teams, invariably some of those teams will be using a Mac or Linux desktops, and they want to be able to do the same sort of development that I'm used to with .NET and SQL Server, or it could be any other server. But I'm going to talk about SQL Server today. How do we accomplish this? I'm so used to local DB running on my machine, or even having a local database server, that I can get a little spoiled thinking that any machine will have all of those same things built in, especially with Visual Studio for Mac getting sort of a backseat at this point. But before we get started, let's talk about the sponsorship for this episode. The sponsorship is me. As many of you know, I've been teaching for a long time and developing software for even longer. And in that capacity, I've been doing video training as well as consulting for many, many years. Well, at this time, I'm taking on new clients and new training courses. If your company would like a training course face-to-face -face with your own developers, or you want to do a remote course with a distributed team, come see me. I have a number of candidates and courses that I can teach, and we can customize a course directly for you. And on the other hand, if you want someone to come in, review your code, help you architect your operation, or if you just want someone to do hands-on coaching with you or your team, take a look at my website here at wildermuth.com. Now back to the video. So with .NET in mind, let's talk about how we would accomplish using SQL servers on other platforms than Windows. Let's get started. I'm here in Visual Studio Code and I have a super simple tiny project that just has one API to return some customers and some related data about those customers. And for development, I'm using LocalDB. This LocalDB is just a small version of SQL Server installed with Visual Studio. And it's very easy for me to look at this and go, well, every developer is going to have this. I can sort of use this to do what I want to. But this really isn't the case. Let's go ahead and run this real quick. I'm going to open up our REST file, and I'm just going to execute that. We can see it just returns some data, and I have data in a database that's been put together using Faker, but I've stored it in an actual database. This isn't data that's only in memory. It's actually in the database. Let's try this again, like we assume we might have a local database instead. And to make this a little easier, let's make sure that timeout is five seconds, and let's run it again. And this time, we're getting an error thrown because it can't find our server. I don't have SQL Server installed directly on my machine, I've been relying on these local DBs. So let's think of a better way to do this. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a new file called compose.yaml. This is a Docker file that allows me to put together what I want to bring up. And compose is similar to what you might think of as Docker file, where you're defining an image. But in our case, we're going to use a pre-built image, but we need to set some things about it in order for us to work with SQL Server. We're going to start with the idea of services. And this could be used to create one or more different servers in some capacity. I'm using Docker Desktop. I'm going to create one or more services here when I tell it to compose my system. We can do that by first giving it a name. I'm going to call it SQL. And this is YAML, so indentation matters. And I'm going to give it an image name. This image is going to be Microsoft.com MS SQL Server 2002 and latest. This will be an image that contains SQL Server. But importantly, this is going to be a SQL Server that runs inside of a Docker container and inside of a Linux Docker container. And I know for some of you that might sound strange, but they've had this working in an image for quite a bit. So when people are doing things like Kubernetes or container apps, they've always been able to include that as a version of SQL Server that they can run against. You're in something like Azure or AWS, you could use hosted versions of those databases as well. But again, this isn't as much about how we want to deploy it in the cloud as it is how we can get other developers working in different environments to work with this. This is not limited to Mac or Linux, also works on Windows, Windows you need Docker Desktop, and I think on Mac you also do, to make this work. So we have the image we want to start. There's a few things we can do here. First, I'm going to set up some environment variables. So accept EULA, and this has to be set for you to essentially accept the user agreement. We're just going to put Y for yes. That way we're accepting the user agreement. We're going to set up a second one called MS SQL SA password. You might be surprised what that is, but that's the SA password for SQL Server authentication. Again, for our development, box, this is all fine. I would not publish this out to the web anywhere because this is going to contain the actual information about what that password is just for your container, not for anything that's out on live. And I'm going to use my favorite public password, password with an at, and you can see it. And those are the only two environment variables I need. I'm also going to tell it the ports. And what am I going to use for ports? 1433 is the standard port, and I'm just going to map it to its same port. And so this 
this will be exposed outside of the container to my machine as a local database. So that period will work in this case, even though it's running in a container. And finally, if we just ran this as is, it would store our data inside of the container. Every time we destroy the container and then restarted it with this compose command, we would lose all the data inside of it. Now, if you stop and start and stop and start, you'll retain that data. And maybe that's fine. But because we need to run migrations to get the basic data into the data store, what I actually want to do is I want to create a section called volumes. Now, volumes is simply going to say, hey, I want to store this someplace that's outside of the container. So before we do anything with volumes, we have another thing we can do up here at the same level as services is called, not a big surprise, volumes. And volumes, I'm going to give it a volume name. I'm going to call it my DB data, and I'm just going to name it SQL data. This essentially is creating a file store that's somewhere outside of the container. On Windows, and I believe on Mac as well, and Linux, this is just going to be a folder somewhere on your local machine. When you deploy this stuff to the cloud, those need to be volumes in a bit different way. But again, we're not talking about that. So up here, I'm just going to say for the volume called DB data, I want to mount it inside the container at a known folder location. Because it's in a container, we can use a folder structure and just mount it right there on the end of the folder structure. You can do that in Windows, which just less common. And I happen to know that var opt SQL Server is where it stores its databases. And so this is the entire Compose file. Go get me this image, start it up with this environment, expose the ports, and make sure that this folder is going to be mapped to actually a volume outside of the container. So as we destroy and recreate the container, it's going to have that same data every time it starts up. So how do we use this? So in our folder, we'll see that our Compose is in this folder. And all we need to do is use the command docker compose up. And the staff staff detach says, don't detach from the container, but let it go running. If you don't include detach, you'll see the entire log for the container as it comes up. But I'm going to start it up as detached. And that will take much longer the first time you run it because it will need to pull down that image. And that image isn't all that small. Again, SQL Server has its own sort of size. And so you can see it's created the volume and then created the actual container. And if we load up Docker Desktop and look at our containers, we're going to see we have this SQL container here, and it has an instance of using this image. We can see that the ports are mapped, and so all of this should work. So back to our console app here, let's go ahead and say .NET build, make sure we have a good building version, .NET EF database update. It's going to apply the migrations I already have here in my data folder just like we did when I built up the original one. Immediately, if you remember, I had changed our server to be just the name of my local machine. And this is going to complain because it failed to create the SSPI context. What is that? That is the fact that we're saying integrated security equals true. Now we can't because we're not passing security information into the container. So we just need to replace this with user equals SA and just use the password here that we had defined in Compose. And for me, that's password, right? Go ahead and save that. Let's try it again. And so now it's done. Let's see if it actually worked. And then we can see if our app actually continues to work. But I have this SQL Server plugin into uh, Visual Studio Code. So I'm just going to add a connection. I'm going to say it's this machine. And I'm going to say store DB is what I think I called it. I'm going to use SQL logins because, again, we're going against the container. And I'm going to use that magic password again. And I'm going to go ahead and save it because I don't mind. It's asking me about encryption because by default it will try to encrypt it. I'm just going to say trust it because because again, this is for development. This isn't anything really big. And we can see that it's created our tables on that local machine. And even if we look at the top 1,000 customers, which hopefully there's not that many, we can see it did populate it with that data as well. So unsurprisingly, we should be able to go ahead and run this and pull up our REST file. And let's go ahead and send that request. And we're actually getting it. Now, we created the volume for a really specific purpose. Let's go ahead and stop our app real quick. And over here in Docker Desktop, let's destroy this entire container. Delete forever. This is deleting all the data that's associated with it, except what is in the volume. The volume is going to be persistent. So we come back over to our terminal and tell it to compose it up again. Because we use the same volume information, we go ahead and run this again. The data is still there. If I hadn't created that volume, because I destroyed the container, all the data associated with the container would go away. 
So what this really means to me is that now can change the way we think about how we develop applications, that having a simple container that has our sample databases, our test databases, can be really useful, not only for distributed teams to be able to have these databases really wherever anybody works, instead of having just database servers that are across some VPN that everyone sort of shares, this allows each developer to be somewhat isolated from other people's changes. But also I've found it useful for doing end-to-end -end testing or integration testing. So we can fire up one of these brand new servers, has the data we need in it, run it. And in our case, we were actually using database snapshots that roll back to the before the test. So we could run a test, do the snapshot back, run a test, do the snapshot back. And so we could create tests that really were telling us whether all of our integration tests were actually running against the real database instead of having to mock that up for anything but our unit tests. So I hope you find this useful. So just a little reminder, go to wildermuth.com. There you can see all the different things I do. I do teaching, consulting, development, as well as coaching. Until next time, this is Sean Wildermuth with Coding Shorts.